Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple data points, use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor is with us this time also in Berlin. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So quickly, I wanted to mention our live show that is happening on Friday night. It is sold out. We will look forward to seeing those of you with tickets there. Those of you who do not have tickets, it turns out that you have the opportunity to watch a live stream. It's happening at 7 p.m. in Berlin, but you can watch it from anywhere in the world at that time, which would be 1 p.m. in the East Coast of the U.S., etc., You'll find the link to that live stream in our show notes, so check that out. We won't see you there, but I hope you enjoy seeing us on stage in Berlin. Okay, so today's show, we will be talking about baseball and a little bit about cricket in the second half of the show, but our first data point is $2 trillion. That is the approximate budget deficit of the U.S. federal government for 2023, according to statistics released Last week, that's about double what the deficit was in 2022. The story or the big drama really is the deficit and debt. We have high and rising debt to GDP ratios, and that was completely ignored in this drama, but really the needs to become front and center. Worse, according to new numbers from the Treasury Department, the gap between what the government spends and what it earns widened to $1.7 trillion in the fiscal year that ended last month, up nearly 25 percent over the previous year's numbers. The Biden administration says the deficit effectively doubled last year. When factors Deficits are a perennial topic in U.S. politics, usually fodder for attacks by whichever party happens to be in opposition at any given time. But this time seems like it might be different. There are growing signs that the deficit is acting or could act as a kind of drag on the economy as a whole. Bond markets are already starting to act a bit anxiously. The interest on a 10-year bond has risen a full percentage point in the past three months which is an unusually large increase. And that seems to reflect, at least in part, an assessment by investors that the long-term outlook for the economy merits at least some concern, which could be understandable given that the overall national debt is now some $33 trillion, which means with those high interest rates, the cost of interest will eventually be America's largest overall expense. So Adam, just to start with a basic question, is the U.S. deficit now too high? I mean, as I mentioned, this is a refrain in U.S. politics, and that's especially always been true on the conservative side. That goes back for decades. But is it finally true now? Is that the message that the markets for bonds and treasuries are, are sending? So the deficit is big. I mean, these are impressive numbers, but however you calculate them and score them, you know, juggling, you know, a couple of hundred billion is a rounding error in this business, it seems. And they're big, especially because this isn't happening at a time of national economic crisis where you might expect the deficit to blow out because revenues would fall and expenditures would rise to meet the urgency of the moment. We're in a situation, though folks in the US are gloomy about the economy, in fact, unemployment is down to 3%, which basically means full employment. And so when you think about what's called the cyclically adjusted deficit, which is the deficit adjusted for the, the state of the economy, and you would normally expect it to be bigger when the economy is slack and smaller when the economy is booming, well, given the state of the US economy right now, to have a deficit running in the kind of ballpark we're talking about here is truly, truly historically exceptional. What else we're seeing is that the bond markets, the US Treasury market is jumpy as all get out. We should have another one of our recurring episodes on this because it's really dramatic right now, the swings in yield that we're seeing within even a day of trading in the biggest financial market in the world. And in general, interest rates are going up. So all of this adds up to you know, a bunch of warning lights on the dashboard saying, from the point of view of a conventional macroeconomic assessment, oh, there's something wrong here. But the question is really kind of freighted with additional meaning. And the two, the two kind of weasel words in here, the telltale words are A, conservative, and B, too high, right? And I don't mean to be like fussy about this, but, but what exactly is a conservative in the United States today would be the question I think we have to ask. And I do think that you could say that genuine concern for the budget deficit would make you a fiscal conservative. The question is, who would those folks be? I mean, clearly not the Democrats at this point who've been running a taps open fiscal policy, though there are some within the party and in the administration who would like, no doubt, to reduce the deficit. And on the other hand, in the GOP, the question is, well, anyone who supports Donald Trump can hardly really be considered in any sense of the word a cultural or political conservative. 
and specifically anyone who voted for either his tax cut or the tax cut of George Bush in the early 2000s, which both of them were acts of extraordinary fiscal irresponsibility. And that basically means the entire GOP. So really, the vast majority of political actors in the US have ruled themselves out of serious conversation as fiscal conservatives, because it turns out to be a matter of political expediency. It's a matter of who's governing at any given moment. You could say once upon a time in the late 90s, the Clinton Democrats really did qualify as fiscal hawks because they, whilst they were governing, tried to restrict the deficit. Right now, deficit reduction is really a matter for the party in opposition. Those tax cuts are a major contribution to the current debt level. All told, the Center for American Progress benchmarks them at about $10 trillion in their impact on the national debt. And of course, they've been extended in a bipartisan vote. So there's a kind of collaboration of the American political parties in maintaining these large deficits. And as look as we look into the future, there's also very little reason for these to be expect them to be closing. The deficit of around 5% of GDP going forward is kind of the baseline expectation here. And that's huge, given the fact the US economy is not in any kind of recession. Is it too big? This is the second kind of weasel word, the word where you kind of slide in a bunch of judgments. Well, what, how could we decide whether a deficit was was too big. The conventional macroeconomic indicator would be inflation. If there was too much aggregate demand in the economy, well, then you'd expect to see accelerating inflation. And that would be a sign that you had too much aggregate demand. Whereas what we know is, of course, prices did go up, but they're now actually coming down. The pace of inflation is has slackened dramatically in recent months. And we're now down to inflation at about 3%. It doesn't seem to be falling rapidly from there, but that's hardly surprising. So on that measure as well, you, you would hardly say, well, you know, we've got an excessive deficit we urgently must do something about. People point to the bond market and say, well, the bond market is jumpy. And there really is some nasty volatility in there, which has a bunch of very complicated technical reasons, which we should get into another episode. But it's also worth saying that the bond market is full of folks that are very conservative in their fiscal disposition and are only too happy to talk up the anxiety in the bond market as a symptom of some sort of underlying problem something has to be done about. And then you sort of bring them back to the economic, macroeconomic fundamentals and you'd say, tell me why with a falling inflation rate that's headed from, you know, eight, nine percent down to three why you're so worried about this, I don't really see what the motivation is. And then you look at what the actual interest rate is to which interest rates have risen, and you'd say it's 2% in real terms. So once you adjust the interest rate for the current rate of inflation, interest rates about 5 minus 3% for inflation gets you to 2 in real terms. And 2% of real interest rate on a 10-year treasury is round about where interest rates were before 2008, when the financial crisis forced monetary policy to drive them down to zero. So one's kind of tempted to turn this whole panic discourse on its head and say something like the following, which is that thanks to very substantial and very active fiscal policy in response to an epic shock in 2020 with the pandemic, with a huge surge in unemployment, America has achieved something incredibly unusual, which is a near full recovery. And one of the good signs about that is that as the American economy has bounced back hard, the interest rate has gone up to something more like a normal level, which it never really attained after the 2008 financial crisis. And 2% is kind of where you'd expect that bond market to settle. And I think that would be, you know, the, the most comprehensive kind of rebuttal of this fiscal policy anxiety, namely that this is really what the world looks like when fiscal policy works on a really large scale. So I want to burrow down here then a bit more and ask, yeah, how exactly is fiscal policy making, economic policy making generally, how is that different under conditions of persistent or even latent inflation like we have right now? Yeah, I mean, it seems to pose some kind of constraint, but what's the mechanism by which that constraint gets transmitted into the economy? I mean, is it the direct effect of higher government interest payments that are the problem or a problem? Or is it kind of more the second order effects of crowding out of private investment, given, you know, the kind of higher interest payments that have to be paid on debt? Well, so the big worry about the interest payments on government debt is that they crowd out other public spending in the first instance. That's the most dramatic effect. And public interest rate payments have surged. They're currently at a really large total of $633 billion. 
2023, and that's up from 300 billion, 300 billion, give or take, a couple of years ago. So a huge surge. By next year, there'll be just a flat out doubling of interest payments. That makes them, you know, one of the largest items of government expenditure after Social Security and the defence budget. So they're a very large item in the government budget. And unless you can organise the funding, the financing, increase taxes, perhaps, for instance, that will come at the expense of other forms of expenditure or new borrowing. And that, I think, is where the real rub is. How will Congress, in its discombobulated state, like make policy around this huge drain on public spending? And, and that's a serious issue if you can't resolve the overall funding envelope. And if you could resolve the overall funding envelope, you wouldn't have the deficits in the first place. From a macroeconomic point of view, it's kind of more complicated than that because, of course, these aren't payments just going into a black hole or disappearing in space. The majority of them flow back to American households and investors that are holding these US treasuries and they get the interest and then it circulates back into the national economy because something like 30% of the American government debt is held by foreigners, some of it does leak out. And that is, if you like, the counterpart to the net gain in resource that America gains in the first instance when it borrows from foreigners. So there is a drain, and this is triggered by higher interest rates. So as the deficit rises, the as the deficit is large and the debts pile up and then interest rates come on top of that, you end up with this bigger and bigger bill of which a substantial fraction is paid out of the US economy because 30% roughly of all the debt is owned by foreigners. And to the extent that they don't reinvest it in the US, and quite a lot of it is reinvested, but to the extent that they don't reinvest it, it serves as a kind of drag on the US economy. Meanwhile, this big budget item squeezes budgets. And thirdly, the higher interest rates, which drive all of this, are acting as a break on the economy as a whole. And I think that's why this configuration of higher interest rates, bigger debt payments, more money flowing out of the US to foreign investors looks like an uncomfortable scenario for the, the American economy. The question, of course, is whether it wouldn't be even worse to have a serious belt tightening and raise taxes and cut spending and whether that the impact of that on aggregate demand couldn't potentially be even worse. But it's a combination of all of those effects which cause people to worry about the debt as such. It's the second order knock on effects of having to sluice this amount of money around the ecosystem of the economy. So yeah, maybe let's just take that question directly. I mean, should it be a goal of economic policy right now to try to get the Fed to achieve lower interest rates, you know, those interest rates that are under the Fed's direct control through some kind of deficit reducing policies? I mean, yeah, maybe also I wonder, are there direct negative effects of these high interest rates that the Fed has uh, imposed? I mean, say if we took a look at the effect on the real estate market, for example, should this overall be a goal to try to get these interest rates down? It's really a tricky and ramified question. I, mean, I think the starting point's got to be that the current rate of real interest rates that we're at, which is 2%, is not a cause for action of any type at all. It's quite a normal level of real interest rates. It is the level that was prevailing before 2008, and it's lower than the interest rate has been for much of recent history. And so there's, there's very little reason to do anything dramatic one way or the other to try and adjust that. Secondly, that interest rate is a combination of policy variables, inflation expectations and the way the market adjusts to those. And because we're talking about a real interest rate, expectations about the underlying American economy and a higher real interest rate may actually be telling us that expectations about the real economic economy of the United States are quite buoyant. And so all of a sudden, the equilibrium interest rate, the so-called R squared, the interest rate at which demand and supply for, as, as the very conventional model understands it, of resources for investment equilibrate is two, which is a healthier sign than it being zero. Because that will be telling you, you can't charge any interest on future invested money and, as it were, be in an equilibrium state. At 2%, you're saying there is at least some rate you can charge people who want to invest because presumably they expect the economy to grow and prosper. So this is the kind of proviso, right? Why would we want to do anything to change this situation? It's really not that bad. But does a current interest rate level, which means that the mortgage rate for a 30-year mortgage in the US now is between 7 and 8%, does that squeeze the real estate market, yes, it does. Do high interest rates squeeze other types of investment? The evidence on that from the corporate sector is actually quite slight. And this is to do with the way in which corporate chief financial officers think about how to 
test the the rate of return on investment projects in business. They rely heavily on internal funding. They set hurdle rates of return, which are way higher than interest rates anyway. So they're so far above the interest rate that moving the interest rate doesn't really make that much difference one way or the other to the decision to invest. But one sector where we do know that the interest rate really does bite is the real estate sector. And that huge step up in interest rates uh, means that new buyers, people taking out new mortgages, are facing much, much stiffer funding terms than they were before. And it is pricing at this kind of rate, tens of millions of Americans out of the new house, you know, the, the first step onto the housing ladder, because you need a much higher level of income for any given mortgage at this kind of level of interest. At a much higher rate of interest, you need a much bigger income to service it reliably. And you can't even get the debt offered to you. You can't get the mortgage offer at these kind of interest rates on average American incomes. Tens of millions of households will be cut out of the market. But the concept, the vast majority of people any given time are not shopping for their first home. And these are the people most badly affected. They are really genuinely locked out, driven into the rental sector where rental prices are quite high. And this is actually a major squeeze point, especially for younger American families. Those who are in the housing market are in a slightly more ambiguous position because they already own a property that's mortgaged. And they, if they were smart, refinanced that mortgage in the last couple of years. And you could refinance a mortgage at the, in the US, a 30-year fixed interest rate mortgage for as little as 2.6, 2.7% interest for 30 years. So you could just sit tight on that home. And so what happens in a situation like this is that the housing market equilibrates, but it equilibrates to a lower level of aggregate supply of homes as people pull out of the resale market for homes and wait out the market. And so that also means then that house prices don't adjust as much as you would expect because the, in fact, there is an effect now pushing the house price up as demand for them falls. And the consequence of that is that very many homeowners won't really feel much difference. The house prices are not plunging. They just carry on paying their fixed income, their fixed interest loan. It doesn't make much difference to them one way or another. But the market gets gunged up. Less houses change hands. Fewer people buy new homes with new mortgages. And all of that then feeds through into the construction sector and its investment cycle. And that is one of the main mechanisms through which higher interest rates do actually tend to slow the economy down. So if we were to take an international perspective here, I'm curious how America's deficit situation right now and this associated question of the bond markets and their reaction to that deficit, how does that compare with the situation that other major Western countries are facing with their deficits and, and bond markets? So the US deficit is much larger currently than that in practically any other advanced economy. So in Europe, there really isn't anywhere that compares with the scale of the US deficit. You have to do this in proportion to GDP because we're comparing very unlike sizes of economy. But in relation to its GDP, uh, America's deficit is a currently like 5.6, 5.7% of US GDP. Uh, in Germany, it's less than half that. It's at 2.1%. The UK, it's at 3.8%. Italy is in the low fives, so just slightly below where the US is at. And if you look at the global bond market, US Treasury debt currently trades at uh, yields at effective interest rates, which are the inverse of the price. So as the price goes down, the, the yield goes up, trades at the same kind of yield as the Italian government debt in the current moment. So both of those are considered heavily deficit running, heavily indebted players in a global bond market compared to the likes of Germany, which really are considered as safe as houses and have a finance minister you know, with iron determination to bring down the deficit. The only advanced economy, as far as I can see, with a bigger deficit than the United States uh, is Japan, which has been running for years now, a very high debt, very high deficit system. And it has a completely manipulated bond market for government debt with yield curve control, which keeps interest rates down there. So amongst the countries with semi-normal treasury markets, America really stands out and is currently, you know, kind of trading at interest rates, which are a little bit like those in Italy. Of course, unlike Italy, the US has full monetary sovereignty. The Federal Reserve can step into the market and control it if it needs to. It doesn't have to now negotiate and haggle with its neighbors. What's also really striking about the American deficit is that unlike any of the European players, even the Italians, there's really no prospect, as I was saying earlier, of this deficit closing. So the Congressional Budget Office scores the deficit at over 5% till the end of the 2020s. 
And it's pretty hard to think of any politics in the democratic world more log jammed and in a more, as it were, frozen impasse than America's politics are in the current moment. And it's pretty hard to think of political players who in the most neutral sense of the word are a more cynical, ruthless, kind of frankly wrecking ball in their approach to government than the GOP. And the last time they were in office um, under Trump on, in relatively similar economic circumstances with unemployment falling to 3%, they did the huge tax cut. And by 2019, this pattern in the US, which is historically unique of high deficits in times of full employment, first emerged. So there's really no reason to think that America is going to deviate from that pattern. And the third thing that I think that really makes America different, apart from the scale and its politics, the fact that they're really, it's quite hard to actually pinpoint any fiscal conservatives in the US. Who are they at this point? The third thing that would be distinctive is US tax base. So the deficit is obviously composed of two elements, expenditure and tax. Within the expenditure element, there's the discretionary side, things like you know, education, military spending, and so on. And on the other side, there's the non-discretionary element, which are what are so called, sometimes called entitlements in the logic of fiscal policy. Those bits rise with structural factors in the US economy, like age or the business cycle. But the far more important and distinctive thing which defines the fiscal logjam in the United States is the fact that the tax side of US government this is the bit that's really frozen. The political parties in the US can kind of haggle over expenditure, but what no one wants to do fundamentally is raise taxes to any considerable extent. And the tax take in the US is now at levels which within the OECD are comparable only to the, you know, this is the rich country club of the OECD. The US is down the end with Chile and what you might think of as very high income emerging market kind of situation. So its tax take varies between like 24 and 26 percent of GDP. So a quarter of GDP is taken in tax in, you know, intensively taxed European states. We're talking about a tax take in the order of 44 to 46 percent. This is where the Denmark's, the France's, the Italy's of this world are. And if you have a tax base as limited as the American tax base right now, and politics as dog jammed as American politics are, it's pretty hard to see how you really escape the, the deficit that we're talking about. So finally, then, I thought I would shift from a, you know, international comparison to a, maybe a temporal comparison. And I'm thinking here in the U.S. context about Bill Clinton when he was president of the United States in the 1990s. He famously took office and designed his budget to try to yeah, lower interest rates in the bond market. And I'm curious whether that sort of deficit reducing budget that Bill Clinton passed in the early 1990s should be a kind of model. I mean, did that, in fact, set the stage as often as claimed uh, for the sustained economic growth of the 1990s in the United States? I think it might be fairer to say that the Clinton administration was hustled into adopting this kind of fiscal constraint by a bond market that sent interest rates higher and a Fed that wasn't particularly cooperative with them at first under Greenspan. And so then the Clinton administration abandoned some of the more high spending programs it has in mind. And, you know, that cohort of policymakers, which is personified by uh, Larry Summers, of course, but also notable pundits, folks may follow these people on, online or in their own podcasts like Brad DeLong or Jason Furman, are pretty true, I think, to that tradition of democratic policymaking. In other words, good stewardship of the fiscal account, keeping the government in check, balancing your books. You could even see this in the first term of the Obama administration when faced with a difficult Congress, the president went before Congress and said it was time for belt tightening in the immediate aftermath of 2008. I think the legacy, the learn, lesson learned from this episode by the current cohort of Democrats is never repeat those mistakes because the people that you're playing with are completely irresponsible when it funds the fiscal policy. And basically, after Clinton came Bush, and, and the Bush not only fought wars of choice, but then chose to not fund them by introducing tax cuts. And after Obama came Trump, and Trump and the Republicans in Congress again drove a huge tax cut through. So the lesson of that is that if you do the right thing, quote unquote, according to this fiscal arithmetic, it's the politi your political opponents who will take advantage to then conduct essentially populist politics directed at their own electorate and above all the elite and highly influential interest groups that benefit from these kind of tax cuts most. 
and that this is really a highly one-sided game and the Democrats can't really afford to go on playing it. There is a further point to make, which is historical, which is that if you're in the 1990s and faced with the kind of real interest rates that America was faced with in the 80s, then you can see why bringing the interest rate down is really crucial for raising investment, because the real interest rate in the early 80s in the US was up around 7% as a result of the Volcker shock. It was then falling to 4%. And what the Clinton team do is manage to bring it down to 3%. In a moment where they really weren't issuing very many treasuries at all, they were running a surplus for a while, they were actually draining the US treasury market. So the the price for the outstanding treasuries was going up because there really weren't enough of them. There were earnest discussions about what life in America would be like when there weren't any treasuries. So their prices are clearly going up. The interest rate comes down, but they only got it down to 3% in real terms. And we're currently at two below that level. And furthermore, the econometric evidence really doesn't any longer strongly suggest any very close correlation between business investment, which is the bit that we're most worried about, and interest rates. And so that whole equation, I think, has really is fragmented. We have a lower interest rate than they had in real terms. It's not clear that investment is coupled to it. And the Republicans have two times over proven themselves. In fact, you could say the same of Reagan in the 80s that they've just proven themselves irresponsible players of this game. And so it's just too politically costly, I think, for the Democrats to repeat that lesson. And we haven't seen much of it. The the Congressional Democratic Party, when Biden took office, was firmly committed to not repeating the Obama mistake of tightening too quickly. Larry Summers has never forgiven them for it. And if they lose next year, they will be held to pay in terms of the internal Democratic Party fight over the legacy of those decisions made in 2021. Got it. Yeah, clearly the Biden administration has taken a different approach to these questions. Bidenomics uh, is not the same as Clintonomics, as we've discussed before. The Inflation Reduction Act takes a different approach than the uh, yeah Clinton budgets did in the 90s. But yes, all fodder for future conversations, I'm sure, also on the bond market, as you suggested. But first, we will take a break here and come back to talk about baseball. Hi, and welcome back. Our next data point is 119. That is the number of times that Major League Baseball has held a World Series. That's the final round of the playoffs where a champion is crowned in America's national pastime. The latest World Series is getting started right now between the Texas Rangers and the Arizona Diamondbacks, I believe. Anyway, it's been a while since we did a segment on sports. Uh, We thought we'd dive into baseball this time. I realize it's not a sport that you played yourself, Adam, having not grown up in the U.S., but let's, uh, let's just dive right in. I mean, first off, I wanted to ask, how exactly did baseball become America's national pastime? That's in quotation marks. It's always referred to that way. Curious, is that belied by the actual genealogy of of the sport in the United States? Well, yeah, I mean, I think in the early 20th century, which is where, you know, our our date for this session takes us back to the early 1900s, there was a sort of myth created of a game, you know, born out of the genius of of America. I mean, in fact, you know, baseball is instantly recognizable to many people around the world as just one of a version of you know, whittled bats and woolen ball kind of games that were played in lots of different iterations around the world. And cricket critic is, in quantitative terms, by far and away the most significant of those because of the huge audience it has in India, Bangladesh and, and Pakistan. But yes, that's where it originates. And as far as I gather, and I really am speaking here as a as a rank outsider to what I know is a matter of passionate concern to some Americans. I mean, it's really kind of in the 80, the mid 19th century that the rules of something resembling modern baseball begin to coagulate and firm up, which is typical, say, of also of 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 you know soccer, football, or rugby. Or the 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 it's the mid 19th century which really begins to give them shape. Um, and so by 1856, already the New York Mercury newspaper was able to declare um, baseball America's national pastime. And apparently it's during the Civil War that soldiers spread the sport across the country, which at the time, of course, was very much a settler colonial migrant 
melting pot of people from largely European heritages, most of whom didn't play this game. And so the Civil War is a kind of bonding experience. By 1869, we get the first team cards being produced. So again, this is pretty stock, you know, kind of story of the emergence of print capitalism and consumer society, you know, 1860s, 1870s is when you'd expect this kind of thing to happen. And uh, baseball could now really wear a kind of made in America label on its sleeve. By the 1880s, the major league team owners are sufficiently well organized to impose what you would expect them to do in the aftermath of the failure of reconstruction, namely a ban on the hiring of black athletes, however talented they might be. And so in the context of, you know, the crushing of the reconstruction dream, you get the emergence of a segregated game. Uh, which then in due course forces the emergence of the so-called Negro League and uh, as, a, as a parallel track in which the talented black athletes would ply their trade. By 1935, so 50 years in from you know the emergence of a professional organization capable of imposing the racist mores of the rest of American society in baseball, By 1935, you have President FDR symbolically flipping a switch in Washington, D.C. that lights up Ohio's baseball field. And this is the first time apparently a night game was played under lights. And so then you get the emergence of the modern baseball kind of vision of of the summer evening with the with the lights and you shift progressively from a daytime game to a nighttime game over the course of time. It's astonishing, though, how because I, you know, where do I go to find out about the stuff? I thought I'd go to the Library of Congress, like as a kind of authoritative source. And like the Library of Congress literally repeats the this narrative, like in what you would think is a critical history. It says the United States and baseball, having grown up together, share a fundamental belief. Anyone who works hard enough can achieve the American dream and play shortstop. Yours, the Library of Congress. Like, like, so it's like this totally uninhibited kind of embrace. And then they have something about Joe DiMaggio saying that, like, who was the son of a Sicilian fisherman and a, he was a, he was a, what is it, a hitter? Like, wasn't he, didn't he like hit a lot of home runs or something? Anyway, so Joe DiMaggio, you know, he said that no rich boy could ever make it big in the big leagues because he didn't want it enough, right? So, so it's this like fusion of the immigrant dream of thriving America which, which you know, has an early 20th century feel for it. And that's, that's clearly where this kind of na- national mythology was born. Baseball, the other thing about it, and in terms of its economics, uh, it famously has no salary cap. Major League Baseball is a league. That means there are no regulations in terms of what individual players can earn. There's no limits on what teams can spend on their players. And I'm curious, what sort of effects does that have Yeah, on player salaries, and on the overall competitiveness of, of, of the league. Well, again, you're talking to a European. So the idea of salary caps is actually kind of this weird American thing they do in America, where like capitalism exists, but in this strange and constrained form. Baseball has this weird elements of like a European model with no salary cap, and yet it remains incredibly parochial. And if you when you compare when you compare athletes in just terms of base salary until recently, at least, I don't quite understand what's happened with with basketball, but certainly baseball was the one area where the top, say, players at the Yankees were paid even slightly more than some of the best, the, the, the global soccer stars. So it was the one American sport where you really did see that kind of breakout in payment to star athletes that, that's quite unusual. And it does, it creates this huge disparity where Alex Rodriguez for the Yankees was making more as one player than the entire roster of the Florida Marlins. Like, you know, I mean, that even by the standards of European soccer is pretty extreme for those to, for them to be competing in the same league is pretty is pretty radical. I mean, because it's so regional, also, of course, develop depends heavily on the catchment areas of the cities that it's located in. So New York and Boston and so on are always going to have larger audiences because it's the folks paying the tickets and watching the TV that generate the revenue flow. But I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't really have a developed thesis about this, and it seems to be highly contentious because basically, this is on the one hand the most American of sports, and yet on the other hand quite unusual. There's powerful trade unions in baseball. Again, something that's rather unusual by European standards. We don't normally have powerful trade unions in sports, and so there's like this complicated bargaining structure, which it's all. I mean, I have to say, it leaves me somewhat bewildered. Uh, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very fascinating area that is is uh, quite difficult to navigate as an outsider. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, finally, though, I thought I would ask uh, about cricket, which, as you pointed out, seems to have some shared heritage with baseball. And when I was thinking about cricket, it got me wondering why is cricket in, in Britain and maybe elsewhere in the world a sport that seems to be associated with the elite as opposed to the working class sport of soccer in those countries, including Britain. Whereas the associations in the United States are broadly flipped. It's, you know, soccer that has a kind of elitist reputation and baseball among other sports is really more of a, you know, a a working class endeavor. So I was really struck by this because I'm um, growing up as the son of a of a working class, uh, well, first generation working class dad. So he grew up in a working class family in Birmingham in the the 40s and 50s. I didn't have this association with cricket because cricket was my dad's game. And through the 1980s, 1990s, cricket was actually a multi class game in the UK. It was also a game of immigrants. So. Obviously, the Caribbean and Southeast Asia being huge areas of cricket play. So it was actually something of a kind of class melting pot. And there were regions of northern Britain and and the Midlands that were famous for producing super aggressive players. So if you wanted a really fast bowler who was white as opposed to a West Indian, you would go to Nottinghamshire and you would go down the mines in Nottinghamshire. And there were generations of ultra aggressive fast bowlers that came from working class backgrounds. In fact, the game cricket was split through the 1960s at the professional level between what were called players and gentlemen. And gentlemen uh, were amateurs and players were professional players. In other words, working class kids made good as professional players. And literally on a team, you would have a blend of players and uh, and gentlemen. And in fact, uh, at some of the major cricket grounds in the UK until until the 60s and 70s, there were separate entrances. Players on the same side would enter the the arena from different gates, depending on whether or not they were being paid or playing as amateurs. And there was an annual game at Lords between the gentlemen and the players, and the players who constituted 60% of the English national time, that is the, the paid working class players, generally beat the gentlemen quite handsomely. And so within the sport itself, there was a whole like language of play that was structured around class understandings. And then when the West Indians came and started beating the English repeatedly, you know, CLR James wrote about it. It was basically a kind of post-colonial, the empire strikes back because the West Indians through the 90s were were just, you know, in terms of, of power and skill, totally i mean you know in a different league from many of the other from many of the other competitors all of this changes begins to change under two influences at the global level it's soccer which just takes over and so in the west indies now it's actually olympic athletes sprinting basketball and some soccer that really dominate and there's been a collapse in interest in cricket in the west indies which is one of the real tragedies of that game and on the other hand there is the churning reconstruction of class relations in Britain, which begins under Margaret Thatcher. And, and believe it or not, one of the ways it expresses itself is that as they put pressure on um, public education budgets and decentralized managements of schools, state schools start selling off their sports grounds for money. And they sold off thousands and thousands and thousands of cricket pitches. So the working class kids in state schools no longer had the chance to play cricket. 10% of state schools in Britain now offer kids the chance to play cricket seriously and so unsurprisingly then the 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 drift in the in the class composition of the professional game drifts towards private educated kids who who actually have the chance to play regularly and that's really that's the the it's this combination of soccer on the one hand which becomes the magnet that sucks everything in and cricket couldn't compete also professionally because there wasn't really a high paying professional league until the Indian league came along. We should really do an episode about cricket because it, you know, it matters at a global level in a very interesting way. But the other thing is this, yeah, the privatization. Neoliberalism killed working class cricket. There you go. That's our punchline. It seems to me like you could get into baseball. If, if It's just a making a leap of faith at this point. If you have this relationship with the cricket, I feel like it's it's like a... Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, I feel it. I feel the tug. I try over and over again. Like I say, it's just through too many games. Yeah. You just need to arbitrarily choose a team, but then it'll all fall into place. But, you know, we can talk that over at some point. But we will stop here for now. 
Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It's produced by Claudia Tady, Laura rossbrow Tellum, Rob Sachs, and Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested in news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Listeners to Ones and Twos even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TWOS at checkout. That's T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love getting your feedback. You can leave voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com or email us, podcast at foreignpolicy.com, or you can tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll be back in your feed next week.